what I cover in the next slide is really a, a short list of general best practices. And the first one is, you know, always starting with purpose, right? And defining a clear attainable goal for your survey. Um, I'm gonna say a little bit more about this because it's so important in the next slide, but for now, let's just remember that the first step is about defining a clear attainable goal for your survey. We often say, don't let your survey get too long. Uh, how long is too long, right? So uh, it, it again, most of the answers I give here is about it depends. Um, and so the idea is you just ask, want to ask questions that make the most sense for you to ask uh, what you want to get information on. Uh, we say uh, often to keep it brief, to keep it simple, and to keep it specific. Um, again, asking only the questions that you need to ask um, and asking them as clearly and simply as possible. How do you know if it's clear or simple? We're going to focus on that in a little bit, but keep that in mind. We suggest that you save open-ended and challenging and more personal questions for the end of the survey. And we do this because it allows for respondents to get comfortable with the survey with the survey by asking these simpler, um, more general questions. And so that's always a best practice, I, I suggest. Uh, the fifth one, we want to allow respondents to respond not applicable or you know, sometimes it's written as N slash A, not applicable. And you wanna do this because uh, sometimes the question isn't applicable to the respondent. And so you wanna make sure that you're capturing accurate data. And instead, of, if you don't have this, they might just skip it. And then you won't know when you analyze the data what, why they skipped it, right? So have it not applicable because you wanna know if it's not applicable to them. The sixth one is we want to suggest that you include a short introduction and a time estimate uh, when you uh, give out your survey. Because before asking respondents to answer questions, you want them to feel comfortable and also to get a gauge how much time it'll take to take the survey. Um, and so how do you know? That leads us into number seven, the final general best practice, which is to test or pilot your survey uh, and your survey platform beforehand. And by that, I mean, you're developing a survey, ask your coworker to take the survey, tell them what the purpose is so they know, like I'm giving the survey to teachers, put on your teacher hat and take the survey and give me feedback on how and how um, and how the survey reads. Is there anything unclear, right? And then for the time estimate I mentioned, when if they're taking the survey online, the online platforms automatically record start and end time. They'll give you a calculation. But if you're testing a paper and pencil one, you can still capture this good information you're piloting it. So have on top them put the start time after they finish the survey, the last question, the end time or the last spot. And then you can do the calculation and, and see how long uh, it takes to take a survey. And if you ask, you know, 20 folks to take your, uh, to pilot your survey, you get an estimate and an average of how long it will take to take the survey. Okay, so those are some general best practices. And in the next slide, I mentioned that I uh, feel that the, the idea of um, survey goal is so important that I'm going to say a little bit more about that. So, but in the next slide, you'll see that um, I give you an example of what it means to have uh, what an unclear and unattainable survey goal would be. And then I provide to you a clear and attainable goal. Um, and so I have here for an unclear, unattainable goal, uh, this survey will help us learn about everything parents are thinking about their child's math homework assignments. So um, if you could see the slide, you'll see that I highlighted a, the word everything. There is no survey that will allow you to capture everything. It's just not possible, right? It's not realistic. So instead, I rewrote the uh, survey goal, and it's a little bit longer, but it explains more. The clear attainable now survey goal I'm going to give you is this survey is designed to understand parents' perception about the difficulty frequency and variety of their child's math homework last year. Responses will be used to shape the school's guidance to math teachers in the coming year. I hope you see how clear that is in terms of how the first one about, you're gonna know everything about what parents think versus we're, we're, we're asking you these questions so that we can plan for the next year. You see, it's a very uh, defined survey goal and it, and it honors your survey respondents, their time and why you're asking them this information. Um, I was mentioning that there are two types of uh, common uh, um, survey types. So we have closed-ended questions, 
um, where there are multiple choice or rating scales or check boxes. And those are really easy for your respondents to answer, right? They provide, if well written, they provide uh, rich quantitative data for you to analyze um, and share out, right? Our second part of this presentation is about sharing out results. And so closed ended questions are one bucket. Uh, the second bucket is open ended questions. It won't be surprising. Open ended questions ask respondents for feedback in their own words. So you often um, see it as a free response, hear about it, it called as free response. And this can provide very rich uh, qualitative data for you to analyze. However, what we will say is that um, since open ended questions take much longer to answer and to analyze, we suggest you include fewer of them and also put them at the end of the survey. So that's just a best practice that we have as well. This next section, um, I'm going to talk about what we call uh, common problematic questions. So I have a list of them. Um, I'm gonna kind of zoom through them a little bit uh, faster, um, but, but these are things that are really important to keep in mind when you're writing uh, survey questions. And so the first common problematic question that I work with a lot is what's called a leading question. And a leading question is really what it sounds like. It's a question that leads you on to answer a certain way, right? It's a question that signals, it prompts, or encourages a certain answer. Um, so I'm gonna give you an example of uh, what I would see as a leading question. The example is how helpful were your friendly library staff members as you engage in summer school teaching? Okay, so the uh, in the previous slide, I'm asking you to take a look at this survey example question. How helpful were your friendly library staff members as you engage in summer school teaching? And I mentioned this is a leading question. So what's the problem with this question and how would you fix it? Type for me in the chat. Oh, wonderful. Folks are already uh, chiping in, flagging the word friendly, right? That's leading us on as survey uh, takers um, that you want us to say they were friendly, right? And so how would you fix this? In the next slide, what you'll see in the next slide is that the fix is, is, is quite easy. It's just making it more neutral, right? Making the wording more neutral. So instead, of what I shared in the previous slide. Instead, in this slide, I'm gonna say, rate the helpfulness of library staff members as you engage in summer school teaching, right? I'm saying rate the helpfulness. So I'm taking away the friendly language, right? So, and then I give them options to answer on a Likert scale. I'm gonna give you another example, uh, uh, another uh, problematic uh, question, which is what we call a loaded question. And a loaded question, thank you, a loaded question is a question that includes an unjustified assumption. So it really forces respondents to agree with the assumption that is in the question, right? So here's the survey example. How much do you think test scores will improve because of your school's new reading program? How much do you think test scores will improve? So uh, similarly, question for you in the chat, uh, folks are already putting in, um, Type for me in the chat, what's problematic about this question? How would you fix it? Yes, I see folks are, are getting it. Improve, right? Improve is that word that is just makes it a very loaded question. So in the next slide, you'll see that the fix I offer uh, is to change out the word improve. So improve suggests is improvement, right? And so instead, let's say, how do you expect test, test scores to change because of your school's new reading program, okay? And so, um, you know, a lot of times when this type of questions are developed is because of the, the, um, the, the program folks, right, want to get information on how their new reading program is, is, is going. And so it, it, you, have, you want improvement, but really the, the proper question to ask is about change. Um, there's lots of uh, problematic question types. So, and the next one, uh, we talk about Double barrel questions. Uh, a, a double barrel question is a question that asks us for an opinion about really two different things, but it allows for only one response. And the example here, the survey example here is, how do you think the students' test scores and attendance will change because of the new after school program? Okay, how would you, how would you fix this? 
So it's asking about two very different uh, things, right? Test scores and attendance. You would hope both of them uh, will be improved, but, uh, but they're separate. One could improve and one could not, right? So I love it. Ch people are chatting in, ask it as two separate questions. That's exactly it. That's a simple fix. Perfect. The next one is about, so we talked about double-barreled questions. Uh, now we actually have something called a double-barreled answer, if you can believe that. And that is an answer option that presents two possibly different opinions um, as, as a response to just one question. Okay, so um, a double-barreled answer um, will show you that um, the question is actually okay. Uh, it's very similar to a double barrel question, but this case, the problem again, it's in the answer. So the example I would, I will give you, you know, the question is, what was your personal experience with mathematics in high school? Okay, so that's a, uh, the, the question. Um, and then the answer choices I gave were right from one, did not like or did not succeed, to five, passionate about, excelled at. And so here, the question is actually okay. Uh, what was your personal experience with math mathematics like? But it's the answer choices that are not okay, right? Because you can imagine someone being good at something, um, uh, you know, succeeding in it, but not really liking it. You know, I can I think about uh, a friend of mine who is really a whiz in math, but she doesn't really like it. She actually really enjoys um, uh, a cartoon. She's a cartoon. She likes cartoons, right? A drawing and act, drawing and the creative side. So she's really good at it, but she doesn't really like it. So you see how it's different. All right. And finally, we have something called a double negative question. Um, and a double negative question is just it, talking about it makes my mind kind of go crazy because it's about a question that contains two negative elements that is intended to create a positive element, which really confuses respondents who take the survey. So it's when you hear people speak double negatives, like the example I give is, is it not uncommon for teachers to coach a sport after school? Is it not uncommon? That's just too hard for people to process, right? You want to, you're asking people's time to take the survey. You wanna reduce cognitive load as much as possible. You do this by avoiding double negative questions. So instead of asking, is it not uncommon for teachers to coach a sport after school? Uh, this is the double negative question. Uh, you wanna say, how common is it for teachers to coach a sport after school? Okay, so that's the fix. You just take out the double negative. So I'm gonna move forward here and talk about uh, liquor scales and rating scales. And so here, um, and yes, you heard me say Likert scale. Um, you will also hear it referred to as Likert scale, which actually more people say Likert. But just a fun fact, uh, I went when I went to grad school, I have a professor who actually knew Likert back in the 1930s. And he was a psychologist who created the Likert scale um, that we are very familiar with and use. And so uh, he his name is Likert. So I say Likert scale. Um, so yes, thank you, Don. Uh, Rensis Liquor is his name. So a liquor scales and, or rating scales are closed-ended questions and really are great sources of quantitative data. And so we, you know, there's this debate in uh, survey, in the survey world, survey design, survey analysis of how many choices is enough, um, how many options. And so uh, my answer might not be satisfactory to some of you. I'm gonna say it depends. It really does depend. For my, my work and for most of my purposes, I would say, honestly, 95% of the time, five choices is plenty, it's, it's enough. Uh, you know, rate from one to five, choose from five options. Um, so uh, if, it really depends on, on what we call, uh, what do you want from it? Is, is, do you want very basic untextured data? If you, if you don't need a lot of texture, you just want folks to get a sense, you wanna get a sense from folks, is it, is it positive, negative, or neutral? Uh, you just need three options, right? So it depends on what it is you're going for. Um, if you need a lot of texture in your, in your responses, I would, I would say five is really good. Uh, we also suggest in your scales that you maintain balance and objectivity. Um, easier said than done sometimes, which again goes back to one of our best practices, always get someone to review your survey, take it for you. But here I give you two examples of options, answer options. Uh, the one on the left 
Okay, the one on the left starts with not helpful. The one on the right starts with very unhelpful. Um, and so I'm gonna ask you, type in chat, is it the one on the left or the one on the right? Which one has more balance and objectivity to the op answer options? Okay, and oh my goodness, you guys are so fast. So I'm seeing a lot of right, right, right. And that is correct, that is right. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is the, the, key, the key indicator for you to see is that there's this middle neutral option, uh, three, neither helpful nor unhelpful. So here it's balanced because you're giving two um, negative uh, op opportunities to respond, you know, very unhelpful or unhelpful. You have that neutral, and then you have two positive, helpful and very helpful. So it's a nice balance, okay? And so I want to make sure you uh, you uh, are aware of the different types of questions like that. Liquor scales and rating scales are often really, really wonderful to, um, to uh, kind of gauge uh, your respondents uh, experience before and after uh, an event, right? And so uh, we hear we talk about, you know, like you, you're, you're doing a workshop. And the example I give here is maybe you have teachers attending uh, a, a, a series of workshops uh, to increase their learning about strategies, specific strategies for English learners. What a perfect opportunity to embed a question, uh, you know, what we call a pre-survey, so the first time you meet with them, before they even get your uh, workshop learning, ask them uh, this question on a survey on a scale of one least confident to five most confident. How confident do you feel in your ability to craft lesson plans with specific strategies for English learners? Okay, so you ask that question. And then, like I said, let's say you have a series of these at the end of the session of the series of sessions you are basically asking the same question. And the only difference is you say after participating in this training, and then if, as you can see, the rest of the question remains the same. And it's a great opportunity that, there for you to, uh, you know, do some calculations about a uh, change in, in knowledge, change in experience, right? Uh, feeling, whatever it is, the topic it is that you're covering. So really love the use of um, liquor scales and rating scales for this. And the following slide, I give you another example you know, folks ask me, well, Tran, that's nice if you have, you know, three or four sessions you can ask before and after. And the next slide, though, an example I give you, it's really the same event, okay? And you can still, you can still capture this data. So it's really wonderful. You, but here is, again, I mentioned, uh, this is an example of measuring change in understanding. So let's say you gave, a, a, you did a training like this, something like this, and you ask this question, uh, in the same, um, again, the same uh, post event survey, uh, and you ask them to, uh, the answer choices would be something like, um, not at all, a little, a moderate amount, a lot, and a great deal, okay? And then you're able to show uh, your, you know, whatever it is, your boss, your funder, your, your, yourself, right? To see if you've made an impact in their learning and you can see how they responded from when they uh, did not, they're self-assessing how much they knew to now they've taken your you know, three hour workshop and now their change in uh, familiarity, comfort, whatever is, is, is now at a different spot, right? So a really great way to, um, to, um, to get data from the same survey from one event. I'm gonna end here with talking about a really uh, meaty topic that just deserves its own, uh, you know, time spot. What we are uh, talking about is about in, uh, how to create more inclusive surveys. So it's really important to, to my organization, to the REL program, that we are uh, putting out surveys that um, are inclusive uh, uh, of um, various lived experiences of, that folks have. And so, you know, I give you just kind of four outlines here from uh, how to create more inclusive surveys. You know, the first thing is just being thoughtful about demographic questions. Uh, you know, long, thankfully, long ago the days where you take surveys and there's like 30 demographic questions you're answering, you're wondering why, because you're not really sure why this all applies to what you're doing, right? So these days, you know, it's just the idea is just to be really thoughtful about um, asking them and do you really even need to include them. Um, you know, make survey, second point is making survey questions mandatory only if a response is necessary. And this is critical, in my opinion, because I've seen so many surveys now where, you know, you see that asterisk where it's required, 
well, really ask yourself, is it required? Um, because if it's a question that is uh, so, um, you know, a sensitive question that you'd love to get information on, but it's not necessary, and there's other parts of the survey you want information on, don't make it required. Let people, give people the option of, of skipping, okay? Uh, we talk about um, being mindful of language use in your survey, and with that, I will say there are just great resources out there, and we link this into our slide deck that you'll have access to. Uh, if you need support in that, it's it, there's a lot of really good free uh, vetted support for for you. And finally, I I do this in my work. I I, you know, I, I do surveys for for a living, but I make sure I consult with resources on inclusivity and bias-free language. I'm just gonna end and say that um, my final thought is that, you know, when we administer better surveys, it leads to more specific and accurate data, which is what we want, right? When we're collecting data and better data leads to better evidence for which for us to make some good decisions, informed decisions. And we do that by following some of these uh, uh, these points that I mentioned in my all my previous slides, so I won't go through them again, but everything that I've reviewed for you, actually, we recently uh, published uh, uh, just last week, even late last week, um, an infographic, a reference guide. It's very short. It's about eight pages. I highly suggest you, um, um, you get, have, get access to that because it really summarizes the, the half hour that I just went over. So I'm really thankful for for that uh, opportunity to have that web, um, the infographic.